I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're actually going to be reading simply one verse from Romans 4 that will be helpful in taking us into the subject that uh, we'll be talking about this evening. Uh, We will be referring to other scriptural passages as we proceed, however. At the same time, uh, you'll want to find your way to Lord's Day 25 in the Forms and Prayers book. That's uh, pages 226 and 227. Following uh, the reading of Romans 4, verse 11, I'm going to ask that we read uh, Lord's Day 25 responsively. So the context uh, of Romans chapter 4 and and of Romans chapter 4, verse 11, is Abraham. And the discussion that's taking place is taking place in the realm of circumcision, uh, which though we do not uh, practice circumcision as a sacrament, yet uh, entirely pertains to the subject at hand, which is the nature of the sacraments. Uh, We'll be discussing, among other things this evening, what the sacraments actually are, what they're intended to do. And Romans 4 verse 11 captures more concisely perhaps than anywhere else in all of God's word what the nature of a sacrament is. So give attention then to the reading of God's word, Romans 4 verse 11. And he, that is Abraham, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. Thus far God's word. Now looking at uh, questions 65 through 68 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Question 65. It is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits. Where then does that faith come from? The Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacrament. What are sacraments? Sacraments are visible, holy signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by our use of them, he might make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and seal that promise. And this is God's gospel promise. He grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of Christ's one sacrifice accomplished on the cross. Are both the word and the sacrament then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed. The Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and confirms by the holy sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. How many sacraments did Christ institute in the New Testament? Two, holy baptism and the holy supper. Well, dear brothers and sisters, friends, as we continue uh, this journey seeking comfort, uh, guided by this ancient document, the Heidelberg Catechism, we come to a rather lengthy treatment of the sacraments. Uh, That treatment begins in uh, Lord's Day 25, as we have seen, and uh, continues through Lord's Day 30. Uh, That alone is an interesting fact, something that ought to get our attention. 
uh, because when we think about the fact that there are 52 Lord's Days and that six of them are devoted to the teaching concerning the sacraments, it should give us a sense of how important the sacraments were considered to be by the Reformers. How important the sacraments were considered to be uh, by those who wrote this uh, catechism, Ursinus and Olevianus. But this is also uh, captures for us uh, this moment, if you will, in church history. Uh, for the Reformed Church is continuing to define itself as over against the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the key areas of difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches uh, pertains to what we believe about the sacraments. And let it be understood that what we believe about the sacraments rests firmly upon the foundation of what we believe concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, wherein we also differ from the Roman Catholic Church. A different understanding of Christ leads to a different understanding of the sacraments. They rise or fall together. Uh, but this uh, ought to also give us pause, uh, because if anything, uh, living in the 21st century, the contemporary church has diminished the sacraments. Uh, if they held uh, perhaps uh, too great a, a place or uh, an unbiblical place in the Roman Catholic Church, in the contemporary church, uh, they have ceased to hold much of a place at all. Uh, and, and even uh, we, perhaps, in the way that we think about the sacraments and in the way that we observe them, do not have a robust understanding of just how important the sacraments are to the believer. Uh, so the idea that we're going to be unfolding this evening is that God has given us sacraments as visible signs and seals of the gospel promises, which are yes and amen in Christ. Uh, God gives us sacraments as visible signs and seals of the message that we proclaim uh, the, the, the promises of which are yes and amen in Christ. Uh, you should have received an outline this evening with uh, returning back to the earlier format with blanks to fill in. Boys and girls, I would really love for you to fill out an outline. And, and you may even ask your mom and dad right now, if you, if you don't have one, if you can uh, run out and grab one. Because I'm doing this especially for you. I want you to understand what we're talking about. Well, as we consider the signs and seals for our comfort, we are reminded or taught from the catechism and from the Word of God that the sacraments confirm our faith. Those are your two words. The sacraments confirm our faith. And we see this uh, represented in, in question and answer 65. Uh, the Holy Spirit works it, that is, faith in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacraments. Uh, notice again that the Catechism here affirms that faith is not the work of man, but rather that faith is the work of God himself the very faith that we need in order to embrace Jesus and the promises concerning salvation in Jesus is a gift that God uh, gives to us. It is a work which God creates in us. Uh, consider what the Apostle Paul says, for example, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 says something uh, quite similar. Uh, Paul there says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. What things come from the Spirit of God? Well, this book uh, to begin with. And uh, 
Paul says the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. The, uh, the man without the Spirit does not accept the Word of God because these things, uh, quote, Paul says, they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you're sitting here this evening, and you understand the message, and that it resonates with you at a deeper level than just uh, the level of your mind. If you have embraced this, this is nothing less than the work of Almighty God by His Spirit in your life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, He doesn't just uh, send His Son. He doesn't just provide atonement but he actually connects his people to his son. Uh, the very benefits which flow out of Christ flow directly from his son. Uh, this is contrary to the, uh, the view of, of many who hold that, that um, the experience of salvation is like climbing a ladder from the, the main floor to the upper story of a home. Uh, that is the view that Rome presents of salvation. Uh, Rome affirms that salvation is of grace. But they do not affirm that salvation is entirely of grace. They do not affirm that salvation is entirely a work of God. But rather that we are, uh, there is, uh, our natural situation is the ground floor. And, and that heaven, uh, eternal life is the upper floor. And that there is a ladder and we are to climb up that ladder. And the Spirit will meet us coming down the ladder. Whether we've made it up one rung or three rung, rungs. Or if we're really good people, we've made it all the way almost to the top. The Bible says. That is not the gospel. That's not the Savior that we need, and it's not the Savior that God has given. It's not the salvation that God has given. He comes all the way down to where we are, enters into, uh, as Martin Luther would say very uh, vividly, into the filth of the stable to find us. And to take us to be with him. While the catechism goes on to affirm that gospel preaching is the means or the tool which the Spirit, uh, I'm going to add the word, ordinarily uses to create faith. Uh, the Spirit always uses the word of God to create faith. Ordinarily that happens under the preaching of the word. Uh, but that may also happen through personal witness of, of believers uh, to unbelievers. But, but uh, let it suffice to say that the Word of God is the means which the Spirit uses. The explanation of the Word of God is the means which the Spirit uses to create faith. And now we're introduced to a new idea, the, the idea of the sacraments. Um, that this faith is not created, uh, but it is confirmed or strengthened by the use of the holy sacraments. Uh, the sacraments now are introduced as a gift from God for the strengthening of our faith. Uh, but the question uh, that that immediately raises is, how do the sacraments do that? And that brings us to our second point. The sacraments confirm our faith by visibly proclaiming and affirming the gospel. By visibly proclaiming and affirming the gospel. Well, as we proceed, uh, perhaps it will be helpful just to deal with the word sacrament. It is an interesting word, and if you were to turn into uh, the concordance at the back of your Bible, uh, or if you go home tonight and you search the, the larger concordances that you have at home, you will not find this word in the Bible. And immediately then you might be concerned, and you say, well, why on earth are we talking about a word that doesn't even come from the Bible? Well, uh, uh, Thelemon, again, this uh, German uh, minister that I mentioned to you last week, says this, quote, In the old Latin translation of the Bible, uh, that which we call the Vulgate, it was used, that is, uh, sacramentum, 
was used to render the Greek word mysterium, that is, a mystery or something that is consecrated. Mysterium signified among the Greeks also either something secret or the mysterious sign of a secret or something that has a mysterious signification which was known only to the initiated. Now, uh, now that the word sacrament and the word mystery are connected, perhaps that triggers a line of thinking in your mind because Paul speaks often of the mystery of God, uh, which was hidden in ages past, but now has been revealed. Uh, the idea of uh, a mystery being something that was hidden, uh, but now in the fullness of time is, is brought uh, out into the open. And the sacraments operate in a similar way. Uh, for on the surface of them, they are very plain. We're going to talk about what they are as signs and seals. Uh, the signification is rather obvious. And yet, isn't it true that only the Christian can appreciate a sacrament? Why? Because it's a mystery that is understood only by those who are initiated. Only those who have come to taste of Christ through embracing him by faith will experience the meaning of this mystery of the Lord's Supper, the meaning of the mystery of baptism. Well, notice that these sacraments are instituted by God. Now, that's what the catechism declares, and this is a, an important line of reference because uh, in a short while, we'll talk about the fact that uh, as uh, Protestants, we believe that there are only two sacraments, whereas the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. And uh, the, the reason for the difference, the, the, the reason we are so restrictive in our understanding of the word sacrament is because we only see Jesus explicitly instituting two sacraments. Uh, we find him, uh, first of all, in Matthew ch uh, chapter 28, as he's preparing to ascend into heaven, uh, giving what we know as the Great Commission. And as he gives the Great Commission, what does he command the disciples to do? He commands them to baptize. And then we'll find a baptism unfolded, particularly in the letters of Paul. Uh, then uh, we find... Uh, toward the end of Jesus' life, uh, we find this in, in all of the Gospels uh, in some way, shape, or form, but then we find it explained as an ordinance by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Lord's Supper. That uh, He actually uses uh, that language that he instituted this. And he describes what it means. We receive as sacraments only that which God has given to us as sacraments. Well, notice the language that the catechism uses. Uh, two words here, signs and seals. Sacraments are visible, holy signs and seals. And that's where uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 11 is helpful. Uh, because we might ask, well, where did the catechist get this kind of language from? Well, clearly, he got this kind of language from the Word of God, and specifically, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 11. Speaking of Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Well, what, what, are, what do we mean? when we say that the sacraments are signs and seals. What does he mean? Well, it will be helpful to ask the question, what purpose do signs fulfill? Imagine a world where there are no signs. And yes, I am referring to street signs. I sometimes think that women would operate better in a world like that than men. Um, but maybe that's just my experience. But signs are important, right? Uh, signs direct us. They, tell, uh, they help us to get where we want to go, where, where we need to go. 
Um, signs, uh, for, for instance, uh, indicating a one-way street are very important, and, you, and you'd had better well take note of the one-way street signs, otherwise you will find yourself in a great deal of grief. And, and uh, uh, even f- from childhood, we begin to uh, help our children construct a map of their surroundings, um, a, a map of the placement of their house and, and of the, uh, the way in which to get to other significant places. You see, signs at their most basic level simply direct us which way to go. And the sacraments act like signs in that way. And where do those signs point? They point to Calvary's tree and the man who hung there. Jesus, the Son of God. The sacraments are helpful reminders, visible, right? We're sensual people. We appreciate the visual, but they're, they're more than, um, than, than simply visual. Uh, for example, with baptism, there, there, there's an, an audible uh, aspect to the water as it drips down back into the basin. Uh, for the Lord's Supper, there is the smell of the elements, there is the feel of the elements, and, and, and these uh, appeal to the sensual, um, the, the, the sensory-driven aspect of, of our humanity and act as signs that remind us again and again and again that we need to re- return to the foot of the cross. They are signs. But they are also seals. And this one is, is the one where uh, we tend to get hung up a little bit. But I believe that uh, we can clear up that confusion rather easily. Uh, first of all, uh, s- the language of seal really uh, simply uh, harks back to uh, like a king's royal seal or the seal that uh, another dignitary may use. Uh, boys and girls, I'm sure that you've seen it or you've read about it in books, um, how they would take hot wax and they would drip it onto an official document or a letter and while the wax was still hot and soft uh, they would press a ring down into that wax at creating a picture uh, a, a relief picture that was unique to the individual sealing that letter and the message of that seal assuming that it arrived unbroken was, this comes from me. And it comes under my authority, and it comes with my word attached to it. It comes with the weight of my authority, the weight of my power. Now, people uh, have gotten hung up particularly on infant baptism and the fact that we call it a seal. But what we need to understand is that the seal is objective, not subjective. It is not an affirmation of the the faith of the one being sealed, but the faithfulness of the one doing the sealing. We cannot affirm often enough. Sacraments are not what we do for God or what we give to God, but they are gifts that have come down from heaven, from God, to strengthen our faith. They speak of God's promises. They speak of God's faithfulness. And we may trust that what he promises in those sacraments will surely come to pass as surely as the object of those sacraments, Jesus himself, is embraced. Because ultimately the sacraments, they connect to the promises of God. There is this inseparable connection uh, between sacrament and promise, which, by the way, is why we insist that the sacraments may only be um, applied or, or used in worship. There is a thought, um, uh, there is a practice in in different. Uh, Christian traditions of bringing communion to people. But that communion is often completely divorced from the Word of God. 
And as such, it's not a sacrament. That sacrament has no value. Because the sacrament, you see, depends upon the promise behind and the promisor behind the sacrament. Uh, the, 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 uh, the benefit of the sacrament depends upon uh, the faith of the, uh, 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 receiving that sacrament by faith. And if it is not received by faith in the promises which are declared along with the sacrament, it benefits not at all, but in fact, actually hardens. Now let's consider the two sacraments as they, uh, as they are uh, described for us in the Word of God then and, and see how this uh, comes to fruition. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, first of all. Acts chapter 2. Uh, so you know the context of Acts chapter 2 very well. Uh, this is Pentecost. Uh, Peter is, is now preaching, and uh, the people hearing the preaching of the word are cut to the heart and ask Peter, brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Uh, notice here in, in this passage, the association, uh, the, the, there's at least a twofold association uh, with this, the waters of baptism. Um, notice, first of all, there is an association between the water of baptism and the promise of forgiveness through faith in Christ. Right? That's the significance of uh, him saying being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. By the way, uh, who, uh, what is the baptismal formula? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Is Peter here collapsing that and saying, you know, I've decided we're not going to do Trinitarian baptism anymore? No, I don't believe that that's the point. Right? The point is simply this that he, he's been preaching about the identity of Jesus, he's been preaching about the work of Jesus, and he's been preaching, uh, now, now he's preaching about the salvation, the forgiveness that comes through Jesus, and, and that um, it is in Jesus that those who are baptized will be washed. So there is an association between water and the promise of forgiveness through faith in Christ. But secondly, there is an association between the water and the promise of receiving the Spirit through faith in Christ. Look at that. Verse 38b, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were to dig back into the Old Testament, you were to turn, to, uh, for example, to Ezekiel chapter 36, the promise of the new covenant, uh, verses 25 through 27, you would find this. The sprinkling of water, <laughs> interesting that it is sprinkling of water, I'll just leave that there, associated with the gift of the Spirit. Now Peter, being a good, uh, a Jesus-taught, Spirit-filled theologian, ties these things together as he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice uh, just a couple of things. First of all, the, the primary feature here is not the faith of the person being baptized. Yes, there is a call to repentance. But the primary feature is what? It's the God of baptism the one who actually performs the act symbolized in baptism, the one who washes, the one who forgives, the one who grants his spirit. We'll now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we turn to consider the Lord's Supper. Now, some of you may be saying we have many unanswered questions. Don't worry, we have five weeks to get to those, and I don't want to belabor them out of the gate. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, beginning with verse 23. 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you turn back a page uh, to chapter 10, verse 16, uh, he asks rhetorically, is not the cup of thanksgiving, uh, that is the cup which is, is, um, of which we drink in the Lord's Supper, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So notice again the connection between the sacrament, uh, in this case the bread and the wine, and uh, the thing which is being signified, which is what? Jesus' death. A and our participation through faith in Jesus' death. Uh, other, uh, other places, he ties that uh, more explicitly together. Uh, Romans chapter 6 would be one uh, very good example of this. But all of this uh, simply to, to demonstrate the point that the sacraments are simply visibly proclaiming and affirming the gospel. Which the Catechist summarizes very beautifully. Uh, again, I, I like to collect these statements because uh, when you're put on the spot and you're asked to give the gospel, how many times don't you stumble and you flounder a little bit and you're like, well, how can I describe the gospel in, in just a sentence or two? Um, I, I only have 30 seconds. I only have one minute. Uh, where do I start? Well, look at this, this second statement in answer 66. And this is God's gospel promise. He grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of Christ's one sacrifice accomplished on the cross. A declaration of Christ's death and of what's accomplished through Christ's, Christ's death Add to that simply the call to, to believe and receive it, and you have a beautiful summary of the gospel. So the sacraments confirm our faith by visibly proclaiming and affirming the gospel and by, third point, and by focusing our faith on the work of Christ. Focusing our faith on the work of Christ. He gives a leading question, doesn't he, in, in uh, question 67? He says, are both the word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? He put the answer in the question. You see how he did that? And so he wants to leave us on the right note. If our understanding of the sacrament doesn't lead us back to Jesus, we have completely missed the point. You see, the sacraments themselves, and by the way, this is another point of distinction with the Roman Catholic Church. The sacraments themselves are not takeout boxes of grace. Takeout is a wonderful feature of life in the 21st century, isn't it? Call up, or even better, if they have the uh, internet ordering, then it's just completely impersonal. Drop what you want in your cart, and, and a lot of them will do curbside. Bring it out to your car, and off you go. But that's not the sacraments, folks. You see, the sacraments don't actually contain in themselves grace. Such that by virtue of, of going under the water of baptism or receiving the bread or the cup of communion, that grace is somehow imparted to you. That's not how the sacraments work. 
No, the sacraments work by first of all directing our faith, directing our focus to Jesus and to him crucified. And saying, do you see the man who hung on Calvary's tree? He promises cleansing. He promises forgiveness. He promises eternal life through his death, through his resurrection, through faith in his name. So then if they are not, if they are not take out boxes of grace, what are they then? Well, you see, where the sacraments are received by grace, I mean received by faith, sorry, Christ himself conveys grace to us through the use of them. Do you see the difference that I'm making there? They do not contain grace in themselves such that somebody who partakes of them apart from faith benefits from them. In fact, the reverse is true, scriptures say. That person eats and drinks judgment to themselves, or as we mentioned this morning regarding the waters of baptism, they are waters of judgment to those who, who receive them and do not embrace the promise with them. But Christ does convey grace to us through the use of them, confirming us in the faith as we receive them in faith. Uh, so that we may, in fact, uh, experience, and, uh, and I pray that you do experience, that as we come to the Lord's table next Sunday morning, that you will walk away from that table nourished, that you will walk away from that table strengthened in faith, not because you had a bite of, of grace bread or a bite, a, a, a sip of grace juice, not grape juice, but because using these visible sen uh, sensory signs and seals, you were reminded of the promises of God which are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. receiving the sacraments in that way, then we may expect to be strengthened and encouraged in our faith. Because God knows our weakness and our frailty, and thus he has given us sacraments of vis as visible signs and seals of the gospel promises, which are yes and amen in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the sacraments which you have given us as a communion with your son, as signs and seals of invisible grace. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the way in which uh, you understand our weakness and our frailty, uh, the way in which you minister to our weakness and our frailty, and the way in which you are ever concerned to confirm us in the promises of the gospel. We ask then, Lord, that uh, both this evening and in the weeks to come as we continue this uh, examination of the sacraments, that we would be encouraged and uh, strengthened in our faith as we understand uh, the way in which you minister to us through the use of these gifts. We pray then, apply your word as you see fit, for we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship the Lord with our